A few years ago, the new owner of this sleepy Somerset field made a remarkable discovery. Buried away amongst the brambles and trees, she discovered this. Intrigued, she did some research and she discovered that these ruins had once been part of a powerful industrial machine, a water mill, which could well have been putting bread on the tables of the people around here since the Doomsday Book. But despite her best efforts, we still know very little about Buck Mill. So we've been invited here for the next three days to reveal the secrets of this powerful feat of engineering. Right. Time to get our noses to the grindstone. Sorry about that. Buck Mill lies near the village of Stoke Trister in Somerset. We know that the ruins belong to a water mill that went out of use 150 years ago, but its past remains a mystery. Although there is one exciting clue, a doomsday reference that suggests beneath the ruins we could find a mill that dates back to the Normans. So by excavating Buck Mill, we hope to learn just how this powerful mill would have shaped the lives of people around here, possibly for a thousand years. What have you managed to discover about it? The oldest uh, mention that I could find off a mill at Stoke Trista uh, goes, back, goes back to Doomsday. And we've been to the um, records office where we found some old maps, like this one here. This is a 1782 map, and the, you can see the mill there. There's a little drawing of it. It's uh, a little drawing, but Mick, it's a pretty big mill. It's got a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? It is, because this is not an arable area. This is not an area where people are growing cereals. We're at the bottom end of what was the medieval forest of Selwood. So you'd expect a lot of trees and grazing and pastured animals, but not people growing cereals. So why do they need a big mill? Helen, I know you've hardly had a chance to look at the documents yet, but have you found any clues so far? Well, no, there's not a lot, really. After the Doomsday reference, where it's worth ten pence... Which is nothing at all, is it? It's not, is no, it? No, no, man. No. And there's almost nothing after that until our 1782 map, so it's going to be a, a, a real detective task to find out what's going on. So, apart from one Doomsday reference, there's nothing else until the 1782 map. And we've no idea how that ties in with the standing archaeology. This is concrete. You don't expect me to be spending three days digging a sheep depot. Because of the tough terrain, our geophys team aren't able to survey the site. So we'll have to rely on our experts to tell us where to dig. That must be the wheel pit. Martin, down there? Yeah, we got the back wall there and one of the return walls, I think, of the water wheel pit. I mean, that ought to be where our first trench is, then. Yeah, I think so, yes. Get the wheel pit cleared and we, we'll know a lot more about the size of the water wheel, where the water came on, which will give us a good indication of the power, how much work it could have done. And as we go down through it, what are we likely to find in it? Well, we may find some bits of water wheel, some bits of metal work in particular, I would think, uh, possibly even some timber. Um, and maybe some scratch marks on the stones where the water wheels fouled it in the past at some time, which will give us a few more clues about its size. But that is actually a crucial part of the mill. I think so. I think it's the, it's the heart of the mill, really. But before we can go any further, the mill has to be stripped of a hundred years of brambles. Hang on, whoa, 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 that's it. Phil's job will be to uncover the industrial end of the mill by digging down into the wheel pit. While at the other end of the building, we're hoping to find what we think is the miller's house. And the moment the brambles around the wheel pit are cleared, we make our first find. What have we got, Phil? Well, I, that's what I was hoping you'd tell me. Some sort of metal casting, look. But I don't... They've got a new break there, look. And that's broken there, but I don't think that I don't think that fits on there, does it? Oops, it's no, that ain't it. We... There's a bit missing. Oh, hang there. on, what's that one? Is it that? that... Ah, that's it. So what's that then? Any ideas? <laughs> it seems a little bit lightweight for the mill, 
but I, I can't think what else it could be at this point. I'm told identifying mill parts can be a bit of a brain teaser because there were so many bits and bobs of machinery required to get the power of the water to the millstones. But we do know our mill is likely to be one of three common types of water wheel. The most basic and least efficient undershot wheel, or a middle of the range breast shot wheel, or the most complex design of all, an overshot wheel. Well, the whole idea of a water mill must have been a very dramatic improvement anyway, because... As technological breakthroughs go, the water mill was a big one. It would have transformed the lives of everyone around it. In a way, they are the first machines. You know, the, the, up until the, the time that water mills come in, the only power you've got is either human muscles or animal muscles. To suddenly harness something like a stream, and then, of course, later on, wind power, and then, of course, later on, steam and coal. It's, it's, a, it's a real breakthrough. It's a complete change. So it had an enormous impact on people's thinking. Drag on a fit back on, Nermar. Back at the wheel pit, we now have another it's piece for our increasingly oh, puzzling it? puzzle. Oh, wow, look at that. That's the bit. Now then, what the hell is it then? Maybe that curve was to do with the actual circumference of the water wheel. With almost no records to go on, we'll be relying on our army of diggers to explain the mill's past. So now the brambles are cleared, they can get stuck in. And as Phil and Martin work their way down into the wheel pit, something else has caught Phil's eye. Look, there's a cavity opened up in here. Look, look there's a piece that, of curving metal going that looks down. Like, there. That looks like part of the wheel, Phil. You reckon that what that I is? Think, I think we found a bit of a metal water wheel. This really is a big discovery, and the more of the wheel we find, the more it can tell us about the power and importance of this mill. Ah, there it is. That's fantastic. That's part of one of the buckets of the water wheel. That's part of a metal bucket. That is the water wheel. It is part of the water wheel. Part of the bottom of the wheel is still in there. Can you date this design of construction? Well, an all metal wheel like that is going to be sort of middle of the 19th century, well, around about. If you can find me a bit more with a name on it and possibly a date, then we'll know. <laughs> Middle of the 19th century, that would presumably mean that that is the last wheel that was in here when the mill went out of use. It's one o'clock day one, all the diggers have gone to lunch, except Phil, who is, of course, a bit of a nutcase. And down here, amongst all this rubble somewhere, we think we've got the mill wheel, the very heart of all the activity here. We couldn't have really dreamt of better in the whole of the three days. But the other thing that's really impressing me is the size of this site now. We started off with just a few crumbled bits of wall and now we've got all this. And if that wasn't enough, take a look down there. Helen, what do you reckon that is? Well, at first sight, that looks very much like an Anglo-Saxon comb. Anglo-Saxon? Mm. This mill is starting to get rather weird. Time Team aims to uncover a monstrous Allied weapon of terror from the First World War. If we succeed, it'll throw a whole new light on one of the most famous battles in our history. An incredible discovery. That's exactly like the photographs. God, that is horrific. The Somme Secret Weapon, a Time Team special, Thursday at 9 on 4. That's where the wall is. It's just after lunch on day one, and we've already found a wheel from the remains of our water mill, Buck Mill, the origins of which remain a mystery, as all we've got to go on is an 18th century map. So it seems that we've been incredibly lucky to find our wheel, as they were usually removed when a mill went out of use. So, Phil, what have we got now? How we got the other side, the wheel, Martin. That's Look, excellent. Here's the actual circumference, inner circumference of the wheel coming round there. And then we've got a bucket there. 
and it looks like we've got a bucket coming in there. But the crucial thing is we've actually got part of the internal structure of the wheel because we've got one of the spokes in there and then we've got another one there, look. Right. And another one here. Uh and another one back there as well. So they're all coming in to that main axle here. But they've just been cut off, have they? What they've done before they demolished the mill was they looked at all this scrap metal in the wheel, thought we could make use of that. So what they've done is they've chopped the wheel off and then when they've demolished the mill, all the demolition rubble has gone in on the top of it and right. the rest of the wheel's been taken away. All you've got to do is find this name and date on it for me. You go away and I'll see what I can do. <laughs> The mill wheel would have needed a steady flow of water, and it should be Stuart's job to work out where that would have come from. Stuart, I would have thought by now you'd have been striding across the landscape, not mucking around in sand. Not exactly play this time. I have been doing a bit of looking at the landscape roundabout. Uh, um, I thought it would be really sensible to try to understand how the, the water works in this landscape by making this sand model. Now, on your model, you've got a blue line, which is presumably a river, and a white one. Yeah, I mean, what, what we've got here is basically a, a valley which comes down here. And we've got a stream which flows all down the valley. If you want to turn a water wheel in an overshot or a breast shot wheel, you've got to get the water higher than the wheel to physically turn it. You can't do that in that gentle valley there. So what you have to do is to go up the valley until you're on the stream at a point that will be higher than your water wheel and basically cut an artificial channel to lead the water off from the stream, bring it along the contour, so that eventually it's higher than the water wheel you want to turn. Is that what Mick calls a leet? That's right, yeah, this artificial channel along here. And do you know that we've got that? Have you found a leet? Yes, you can see this going sort of way beyond the mill where they're excavating at the moment. It's a deep channel going along the contour. So we now know millers went to extraordinary lengths to get water to the mill. But the 1782 map would suggest they also put a lot of effort into their homes. And our second trench is now going in over the end of the building we believe is the miller's house. And within seconds, Faye and Rakshar hit a rather posh stone floor. This little bit here. I just want to see what's happening here. It seems to be disappearing. Yeah, I think, yeah, if we just go to that level. Yep. Yeah. And then we can hand dig the rest of this. In the middle of the building, Tracy is looking for the cog pit, which would have held the gears required to transfer power from our 19th century mill wheel to the millstones. Mick suspects the mill's history should go back much further. But the big question is this is only, what, 18th, 19th century? What's underneath it? Well, yeah, that's the problem, you see. We could end up with a really good plan of an 18th or 19th century mill, for which there are hundreds still standing. So they've all been turned into tea shops, haven't they? Yeah, and posh restaurants, the sort of place you go to, you know. What we really need to do is to go through underneath this, where there are holes in the floor, and see whether the 16th, 17th century mill, with all the fittings and, and pottery and stuff going with it, is, is encased underneath somewhere. That's the only way we'll get the early stuff. I don't go into tea shops. And in the cockpit, Tracy has uncovered what could be another important piece of the mill's machinery. I mean, we've got, we've got the cog hole here, which would have attached to the wheel. The cockpit, which would have been in here, we haven't got it yet. OK, but that's good, demo. isn't it? Yeah. But then behind me, I think you're going to like this. Oh, crikey. First millstone. Yeah, yeah. Half a millstone, anyway. A half a one. Is that in situ there, is it? Well, we don't know until we've cleaned around some more of the demolition material, but it does look very flat. It might form the back wheel... Uh, the back wall, rather, of the cockpit. But that should help, because the size of it, the type of stone, the patterning on this will give us the date of it. Yeah. And then we see it coming up down here where James is working. We've got the floor coming up. Great. Yeah, it's starting to really come together. So across the site, there's a strong picture of the building in the 1782 map emerging. All we need now are some solid 18th century finds to tie in with the ruins. But the only finds we've got so far are pointing to a completely different era. 
It's all a little bit late for me. I mean, just looking at this, I mean, to my semi-untrained eye, I mean, that looks like an Art Deco bottle to me. Very much. And you've got this, you've got this beautiful blue glass ashtray again. Looks Art Deco. I mean, have you got any idea what date any of this? This bottle here with its clear glass and the mould seam running through the lip is, is certainly post-1920 and possibly even later than that. It's a technique that wasn't used until the 20s. It looks to me like the locals have just basically been using this as a rubbish pit when it's fallen out of use. I mean, you've got everything you can possibly imagine from a household of the period dumped in there, I think, haven't you, in the night, from the 1920s and 1930s? The archaeology of Buck Mill isn't proving as straightforward as we first thought. So can our 9th century Anglo-Saxon comb help clear up the mill's past? It's got these lovely blue-green coloured rivets, uh, which are what would have held the whole comb together. Then if you have a look at this inscription on the bottom, you can see it says copyright BP 1999 West Stowe. <laughs> so my inference is that this was bought in the gift shop at West Stowe, which is a fantastic place to visit, um, and was perhaps deposited on our site by somebody who came along and saw that it looked like a, a very ancient place with an ancient wall, lovely tree growing at the top. You know, and this was the right place for perhaps <laughs> their sacred comb. Or maybe it was planted by someone who knew we were coming. Possibly. <laughs> Whatever, this is not the scene that I thought we were going <laughs> to... Our rather convincing replica comb means we're still stuck in the 20th century. In terms of dates, this site's really not making any sense at all. And the only solid historical evidence that can take us any further back are Stephanie's 1782 map and the reference in the Doomsday Book to there being a mill somewhere in this parish in 1086. Which, for some reason, two of our experts now seem to think might be in a nearby field. And I thought, what the hell is another leak doing <laughs> cutting across country like yeah. this? Well, I mean, I, I, as I walked, it, I've, I've had exactly the same thought. And I, I think I'm walking along a leak, same as you it's do. That's what it looks like, and, isn't and, it? and you carry on. And, and does that make sense to you? Uh, absolute sense. So we've walked all the way down. That's the street. bottom of the valley, isn't it? That's, right. That's where the stream should be when it's walking. Doing that quite nice, isn't it? <laughs> what are you guys doing? Everyone else is about 300 yards over there. <laughs> We've looked at the earthworks and we think this is where the early mill is. <laughs> Here? Yeah. But I thought you said that the early mill was underneath the later mill up there. Well, this might be another mill. I mean, everything points to being a mill somewhere where we're standing here at the moment. What sort of day? 11th century, something like that. Or, or earlier. Or earlier, earlier. yeah. Are they earlier. common? Less than half a dozen have been excavated, so it's a real find. What an extraordinary day this is turning out to be, and it's only day one. Who knows what else we'll find in this sleepy Somerset field? Maybe we'll get a brush to go with our comb. It's the start of day two in Somerset, where we're trying to get to the bottom of a water mill, Buck Mill. Spurred on by a doomsday reference, we were hoping to find a much older mill beneath it. But last night, two of our experts had convinced themselves they'd found an early medieval mill, possibly our doomsday mill, 300 metres to the west. So, with half our team now shifted to this new site, Mick and Stuart's reputations are already on the line. Where the leak comes through here, there's a potential that it's still wet down, down at the yeah. bottom of it, yeah. it's certainly yeah. wet, wet further up, so it yeah. could get quite sort of dark. The only problem is, Geophys can't see anything. Emma's done the model now, mm. the topography, and it looks really nice. Just looking at it in plan, you can see the leak clearly coming through here. She's with... got the turn as well, has she? You've got the turn as yeah. well, the, the bank showing in red. Yeah. But there's nothing here that suggests building to us, but we wouldn't expect to see well, that, it. That was going to be my question. Would you expect to see a timber Watland door building that's got no occupation in it? Mm. No. Right. They might not be able to see any remains of the mill, but Geophys helped them pick the most likely spot for it to be in. So that's where we're putting our third trench. We've got the cleanest clay there, and there's almost, you could say, there's something there, something couldn't there, you? Yeah. Well, just looking at the Geophys, the way you've got that arrow straight lead yeah. and then the wiggly bit, I mean, that is classic mill. If there's one ear, this is where it should yeah. be, you know? If they uncover a mill dating back to 1086, it'll be a major discovery because of the 6,000 water mills recorded by the Normans in the Doomsday Book, only a handful have ever been traced. 
What is it in the landscape that makes you think there might be an earlier mill up there? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, this depression we're in is the original stream course, the meandering course, the stream that comes down the valley. See, it rises up up here. Yeah. And where Mick's heading up here... Up, up here, look. Uh, you know, that terrace, he's walked this up from all the way up there, he's walking along it. That carries on up this side of the valley, up into the hills up there. And what that leach should be doing is bringing water, because we like a mill, just about there. Well, let's make it a bit more dramatic than that. Here, <laughs> here, here is your theoretical yeah. mill. Right, let, let me explain that in a bit more detail. Yeah. What you find in the landscape is a big leet which starts high up there, yeah. comes in a nice gradient. This is the terrace that Mick was walking along, just there. Yeah. It comes all the way to here. And then it turns a corner goes back and goes back into the stream. It's the same sort of principle you've got at that mill. So ideally, there should be a mill somewhere about there. I've seen the geophys. There is nothing there. <laughs> no, but you wouldn't expect that, you see, because this is not a site that's lived in. It's not going to have hearths and fires, ovens and so on. You wouldn't expect it to show up if it's a timber building. We're happy either way, you know. I mean, if it's milk, great. Fantastic. If it's not, we'll have learned something. <laughs> <laughs> Quite how arrogant and wrong you are. <laughs> Compared to the industrialised Buck Mill, an early medieval mill would have used very basic technology and would have looked something like this. Built largely from timber, all that's likely to remain of it are fragments of wood or traces of post holes. So Matt and his team are sifting the clay for any possible fragments of mill they can date. While Mick and Stuart's early medieval mill remains a rather wild theory, thankfully we do have a real mill that we're excavating. Phil hasn't stopped digging into the wheel pit at Buck Mill since he uncovered a section of water wheel. Oh, Martin! Come on, Hello, look Phil. at this. It's getting quite a lot of this wheel oh, now. You've... You've got a lot more showing now than yesterday, Well, that's you? right. You see, I mean, yesterday, if you remember, we started to expose the wheel over there, but now we're away from the wall. Look, you've got a nice run of the metal wheel running oh. right down in under my feet, and we're beginning to get these spokes going right through. It's going to be fascinating. You've exposed so much more of this now that I can see that my initial thoughts weren't quite right. In what way? I was thinking that it was a, a, br a brush shot wheel turning that way. Ah! And now, as you can see from the way the buckets are, it turned that way, didn't it? It's an overshot wheel. The water must have come over the top. They could only be filled on the downside. Well, you can actually see that here because of the curvature of this bucket here. Forgive my ignorance, but what difference does it make which way round the wheel goes? Well, in a way, the direction doesn't matter too much. It's where the water comes onto it. The fact the water's coming on the top and it's an overshot wheel means it's the best solution. It's the most powerful, it's the most efficient type of wheel you could have. So is that really up in the status and, and power of this mill? Yeah, I think we're, we're putting it up where I'd like to see it, really. It points to this being a, a, an older site with a, an overshot wheel. So this final phase of Buck Mill is both older and grander than we first thought. And Martin says he can tell us exactly how powerful it was by crunching the numbers from its measurements. Old money, three foot six, new money, 1.07. With no finds yet that tell us anything about the previous occupants of Buck Mill, Helen has enlisted the help of its current owner, Stephanie. So I've been doing quite a lot of digging about and I found um, a couple of references I think are quite interesting. This is a will of 1703 made by a chap called John Benjafield. Now he describes himself as John Benjafield the Elder of Buck Mill in the parish of Stoke Trister, Miller. So he is not just living at Buck Mill, he's actually defining himself as a miller. Uh, and he leaves all sorts of bequests. He's obviously quite a wealthy man, but he doesn't specifically leave the mill to anybody. So I think it's being rolled up with the residue that's going to his, his wife Marjorie here. Oh, yeah. Which is interesting, interesting isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So presumably he's leaving the business to her. Yeah. Which yeah. I think is lovely. And uh, it mentions here, my said daughter Mary. 
Yeah, he's leaving her £100 here, yeah. and I think elsewhere she gets another five. And there's another Mary Benjafield that crops up a bit later. Now, this is a deed. Um, dates to 1790. Now, if you look along this line, it says, late in the tenure or possession of the said Mary Benjafield. Oh, yeah. So, 1790, it can't be the same one, I wouldn't have thought, but it could yeah. be a, a, a granddaughter um, yeah. or great-granddaughter of John Benjafield. So, we're getting a few names. We're beginning to piece it together. At the industrial end of Buckmill, Martin is ready to reveal its vital statistics. Yes. We've got the diameter and the width of the wheel, about 12 foot diameter, three and a half feet wide, six horsepower. Does that make it a big mill or a little mill? Sort of average, average. Um, gives plenty of power for driving a pair of millstones. So even though we've got a very big building, we've only got a middling-sized mill, which sort of makes more sense, doesn't it, given the kind of area we're in for? Yes, but given this type of area where you've got a lot of pasture land, it just shows that if you did have a, a corn mill here, it was a very important building. So our mediocre mill might have been an important building in the 1830s, but the records tell us nothing about the millers who were running it at this time. But further back, Helen has uncovered a little dynasty who ran Buckmill for at least three generations from the 17th century, the Benjafields. And at last, the diggers could have made some finds that could tie the Benjafields to the remains of our miller's house. We're getting quite a nice selection of pottery from under the floor now, and some of it's 17th century. Um, which is that? Uh, things like this. It's the local Donia Earthenware. Could this tie in with our Benjafield family? Well, John Benjafield, the miller who dies in 1703, his children are, are born during the 1670s and 1680s. So they could well have broken this pottery? They could, if they were badly behaved enough. <laughs> what else have you got? Well, some of this would actually date reasonably closely to that. These fragments here, um, I could date those to about 1660 to about 1680 or thereabouts. And we're getting a little background scatter of earlier stuff. That piece, for instance, is 16th century, so that's a little bit early. Anything else that you can work out from the pottery scatter that you've got? It's all more or less the sort of thing you'd expect in this part of the world. The cup is quite nice. Yeah. I mean, it's not it's fantastically high status, but it's still a nice piece for the time. Thanks to the Benjafields leaving some of their kitchenware behind, we're in the exciting position of being able to connect them to this earlier phase of the mill. I'm hoping this luck will have spread to our other site, where they've spent all day digging the lumps and bumps in the landscape, Mick and Stuart are convinced contain an early medieval mill. They've opened two more trenches up, and as Mick and Stuart are discussing opening another, it seems they might still be looking for it. The mill's not going to be massively far that way, no. because they, they use the water for the wheel, and as soon as they finish with it, it's off back down to the stream. Chuck it back in the stream. That's what's yeah. going down there. Yeah. So it's really, if it's not in this section here, we need to be sampling along this terrace here for perhaps another 30 metres to see if it's in this, because it really ought to be in the next 30 metres or so, I would suggest. Well, why don't we put a trench in that takes in the edge of the leet? back along that 20 or 30 metres mm. because there ought to be something coming off that and we'll see it on the edge of the lead if it's there. And, and use the lead as a, as a guide. After half an hour of our two experts deliberating on where they should dig next, our diggers are struggling to share their enthusiasm. Oh, yeah. I can't believe that they've gone to all that trouble to bring the water mm. for no reason. Yeah. You know, it doesn't make sense that there should be something yeah. to use that water when they get it here. It doesn't mm. just, otherwise it doesn't work. So Matt and his merry band of diggers now have another trench to open. OK, oh, yep. helmet's, helmet's on. Ian? Ian? Yeah, he woken up yet? Not yet. <laughs> I fell asleep halfway through. I've lost, lost the will to live at this point. <laughs> It seems as though the doubt must be contagious, because at the site of Buck Mill, Phil has just thrown everything up in the air, just when I thought it was all coming together. So Mick is taking a break from his wild goose chase to try and get to the bottom of Phil's woes. Phil! Last time I was here, it was all covered in scrub and up 19th century. We've done a hell of a lot of work. 
We have. And now it's all complicated. Is the house at the other end then still a house? Is that still contemporary? I think that's still residential, yes. Yeah. But we've still got to actually try and tie in the actual phases of building with what we've got where Tracy is. Yeah. And then we've actually got to start building on from that and trying to actually understand what's going on in the phasing over this side. And this wall here, you see, once we get up on the top here, yeah. we've got a wall coming through here, yeah. comes through underneath here, and go straight down through the wall pit. Yeah. This doesn't appear to come straight through here. Look, we got this one that comes across there. Yeah, yeah. So there's walls everywhere. And until we actually look at the at the way each wall joins on or, or yeah. butts up against every other wall, we won't understand what's going on in this building. It's going to be tricky, isn't it? We can do it. Somewhere in this area, Mick and Stu are pretty sure that there's a Norman mill. In fact, they've staked their reputations on it. Well, they've looked here and there isn't a Norman mill here. They've looked over there, no Norman mill. See a trench over there? There's no Norman mill in that. But if you look here, well, I leave you to decide what. Oh, here. it's Mr. Misery again. Dear, here he comes. Oh dear. <laughs> Do you know what that is? Go on. That is a line. Yeah. And see these? These are your reputations, and they're on it. <laughs> we don't care. We <laughs> don't care. We don't. We're still confident. Absolutely. This has to be the site of the mill. We, yep. We've got this leaked. We can see it in the ground. We can see it in the side of the trench. We can see it in that trench over there. Everything focuses into this area in the corner in here. I love the way they keep rediscovering the leak. We've known about the leak for 24 hours. Never mind the leak. Give us the mill. <laughs> Give us the time. <laughs> so with only one day left, we still have an entire early medieval mill to find and a lot of detective work to do. In spite of this, the team feel they've earned a treat, or as they prefer to call it, some experiential archaeology. We're rewarding them with some genuine medieval bread uh, and some cheese. And because this is Somerset, they've got some genuine Somerset cider as well. This is a good version of what the medieval peasant diet would have been like in Somerset, you know. We know they had lots of cheese, they drank cider, and we know they ground up corn to make bread. And the upper class people ate the white bread, which isn't very good for you. Yeah. And the peasants ate the brown bread full of bran and stuff, which is really good for you. There's a good history lesson for you at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> So what are we going to do tomorrow? Well, I mean, the story is really, really complicated. Yeah. And the, the thing we, we really got to try and get our head round is the relationship of all those walls, because yeah. it's a very, very complicated story. Mm. I suppose in the end of the day, we should be sorting the wheat from the chaff. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Actually, when you come to think of it, there are a lot of phrases in everyday use yeah. that Grist, come from milling. Grist yeah. to the mill. Yes. yes. Yeah. The site is a total millstone round our Yes, right. Really? Sorry, I... I, I <laughs> Stop now. This is a serious archaeology programme. No more of these run of the mill jokes. Oh, oh wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Have a bit of bread. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Cheers. To day three. Cheers. Beginning of day three here in Somerset, and yesterday evening everything seemed to be going swimmingly. We'd got our lovely mill, Buck Mill. We knew what date it was, what it was for, how it worked, all that kind of thing. That was until the archaeologists started drinking that cider. After three glasses, they began to have doubts. After four glasses, they were racked with doubt. They no longer think that all that is all this. But why don't they think so? And if it isn't that, then what is it? Big, what's the problem? I think the problem is we've got so many walls, uh, we don't know what phase is what at the moment. So this isn't all part of one mill? Oh, no, clearly not. So is it fair to say that this isn't this? Well, in a way, but what they've done there is they, they, they've put a facade on a whole mishmash of buildings that were there before that have gradually developed to make it look as if it's one new build. So how are we going to tell the story of the mill or the mills on this site? We need to look at the junction and the change of, of direction of every piece of wall across the site so that if that bit going across to where Phil is, is, is contemporary, he's obviously happy about something there. Look at him, there. look at him, look at him. <laughs> 
look at him. <laughs> He's obviously sorted that, right? Yeah. Got another phase in here. Uh, another one. Another right. one. So there's another phase. Oh, I thought it was good news. It's <laughs> bad news, really, isn't it? You've got a lot of work to do and not much time to do it. We have, we have. We've got a, a lot of junctions to look at all over the place. Yesterday, we were beginning to get a clear picture of the Benjafields, who lived here from the 17th to late 18th century. But the archaeology of the mill is giving our diggers a headache to go with their hangovers, because the walls seem to suggest 40 different phases. When Stephanie invited us to dig her mysterious mill, we thought explaining its past would be easy. Any news? <laughs> I wish it was. I mean, first thing this morning, everything went very, very well, and we established that, in fact, we got two phases of building up on the top there. We got the early phase, which is that main block of wall over there, and then this later wall here, which has been tagged on, probably when they put the metal wheel in. Now, we think we can see that this stone that belongs to this wall here is actually mm -hmm. later than this wall. So that is not likely to be part of the original mill. Right. What it might be is a wall that was put in when they put a narrower wheel in. So right. the current theory is, is this wall part of the original mill? Mm -hmm. Was there a much wider wheel pit in here? And that right. when they actually put in the narrower wheel, they backfilled yep. the cavity with a lot of rubbish which is why there's so much instability and we've got all these cavities. Right. But... But? There's always a but. There is a but. If we've got a wider wheel, we should expect to have a wider hole up there for the water to come in. Absolutely. And at the moment, we haven't got it. So, it was going very well first thing, now it's not going quite so well. With the inner walls of this building still a jumble of confusion, Faye and Rakshar are investigating the outer walls in the hope they'll give us the bigger picture. We're looking for the corner of this house, so we're hoping it's going to be about where Rakshar's standing. Yeah. You might have to get rid of some of this, though. Some of our vegetation yeah. all this way. because we might have to go a little bit that way. At the site of our possible early medieval mill, Matt and his diggers have spent a day and a half sifting through clay, but have yet to make a single find. And if you thought life couldn't get any more miserable for them, it started to rain. The only person who seems unfazed by the many phases of Buck Mill is Helen. Yesterday's finds are telling her there was once a flourishing family business here. Well, we've got a will of the miller um, who died in 1703, John Benjafield, and he leaves a big estate. It's worth something like £300, and it includes land as well. Now, I don't think he should have been making that money from the mill. Did it come from the land? Maybe. This object that I'm just halfway through cleaning really illustrates that, because it's a, it's a clothing clasp. It's got very detailed, very well-cast decoration, and you can probably see in the sunlight that it's got a little bit of silver coating on it, so when new, it would have looked like silver. This would have looked really smart. And there's also a tantalising glimpse of another, much earlier miller. We've got another clue here. This dates to the first few decades of the 16th century, so it's nearly 200 years older than the 17th century items. It's a, a purse hanger, so it would have had a, a fabric purse hung from this little bar here, and the, the loop would have been tied with strings to the belt. So it would have had coins or something like that in there. And so it's the kind of thing that you wouldn't have unless you had a bit of money. A very much a kind of middle-class item. And that was also found in the 18th century mill. So one wonders if the people associated with the mill were always a bit more middle-class than you might expect. The scale of the mill house that John Benjafield lived in late in the 17th century also points to our millers being surprisingly posh. That is the corner coming through just there. Perfect. So we've got the corner of the house, and I actually think what I am is the front wall of our house. Yeah, if you actually look just here, it's perfectly aligned with that 
that front doorstep. And in front of you is our side wall of the house. Yeah. And in there should be our nice floor. This should be a nice flag surface, yeah. Brilliant, perfect. You cracked it. Revealing the corner of the mill house has given us a sizeable chunk of solid archaeology. It's just a shame the same can't be said for our early medieval mill. Well, you two have given Matt a great couple of days, haven't you? <laughs> He's happy you... in his hole. What you got, Matt? Well, we've put this section through the leak area here, and you can see this kind of brown silt fill there, and then we've got these clay bands, the blue clay and the yellow clay bands, but, I mean, that's about it, really. I mean, I'm no mill expert, but uh, I don't see much. You may not be a mill expert, but is there anything down there that looks remotely, even vaguely, like a mill? I, what I'm prepared to say is there is a water course coming through here. There'll be no fines and there's no evidence of any structure or anything like that. Mm. We're stuffed, aren't we? I don't, I don't, no, no, I don't think no, we're... There's no, always no, going to be a long all. shot, this no, town. No. Don't, don't be like no. that. This is always going to be a long yeah. shot. We've only got, what, a metre and a half wide. It could be under here, it could mm. be down there. It's going yeah. to be a very ephemeral structure. What do we do now? I think, I think we stop. We haven't mm. got time to chase it any further. Somebody else might come back and look further, but there's nothing more we can do. Yeah, but I'm not giving you a hand. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, they're going to keep on saying there's a mill here, and with over 70 years' experience between them, who am I to argue with them? While our early medieval mill is condemned to the clay, at the cockpit of Buck Mill, Tracy has had what can only be described as an archaeological epiphany. Well, yeah, had a real Agatha Christie moment earlier on. Come on, give us your moment. Well, we have the strange tale of the broken clasp, the smashed teacup and the careless smoker. Recount the story to me. <laughs> well, we got down to the bottom of the cockpit yesterday. Yeah. Um, and we've got a really well rammed in stone floor down there. Yeah. Underneath the floor, just at the point where it was being laid, we found this. It's mid 17th century and would have been some sort of dress fastening. Mm -hmm. So somebody's been standing up here. This is broken off and fallen down. They haven't found it. They've carried on laying the floor. So that gives us a really nice date for the laying of the floor. Then straight away, when the floor has been laid, before anything's built up, no silting or anything like that, we have a chappy, he's smoking his pipe. This is the careless smoker? This is the careless smoker. And he's smoking his pipe and he's dropped it and he's smashed it. Why is he careless? Well, you can't have a naked flame in the flour mill because the flour will just combust and yeah. boom, bang goes your mill. So the only time he could have been smoking was when they were building the walls. But then, unfortunately, the same poor chap, he's had his cup of tea and he's smashed his teacup. <laughs> <laughs> and what sort of date is this? The cup dates 1660 to about 1680, so that ties in really nicely with the clasp and gives us a good dating for the construction of the first phase of this part of the mill. So very possibly thanks to John Benjafield and his Butterfingers, we now know that the earlier phase of the mill was built between 1660 and 1680. But just how he became so wealthy remains a bit of a puzzle. Because the mill was only average in size and power, we don't know how he came to have such a big house. Unless perhaps he had his fingers in other pies. Although they've run out of time, it seems Mick and Stuart haven't entirely given up on their early medieval mill. Let's say 1,200 in round figures, yeah. And that leet is another one like that one, like that. It's a leet to bring water to. Oh, no. No! <laughs> yes. <laughs> you said a it. third mill. Yeah, absolutely. Third mill. That's exactly what... Which, which ought to be there by 1,200. Yeah. So the and our two top experts have cooked up a theory stretching back a 1,000 years as to how this landscape could have supported three mills. What that points to is a sequence of events in that we've got one system coming down here on this side, which is very low technology, low gradient, to, to mix mill down here. We've got one system coming down here, leading to another mill just here. These two are fairly inefficient, low technology. It's replaced by Buck Mill up here, implying a sequence of three mills. It's a fantastic story, and we're just going to have to leave these two mills vivid in the sand, because <laughs> yeah. unfortunately we haven't got the time to dig them. No, no but I, mean, I think, you know, if we came back, we'd know exactly where to go now. Mm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Phil has finally solved the problem that's been giving him a headache. How the water was brought to the mill wheel during the 17th and 18th centuries 
when a much wider water wheel was in use. It's been a, a real archaeologist trench. It's been really challenging. It's been wonderful. What was the challenge? Well, what we really wanted to try and do was try and establish whether or not there had been a wide water wheel in here before the narrow metal one. Now, to put that metal wheel in, you have to block off this wide opening. And so what I really needed to do was actually find the proof. And the proof is in here. We started at the top and we began to and realise that this was actually part of this big blocking. And originally we thought it came to here, we thought this was going to be a major stone wall. But the crucial bit of the jigsaw was taking off all the lime scale that covered this part of the wall. And you can see here, actually, now I've got rid of the lime scale, that there's a joint running up through here. This is part of this major wall that runs down here. All of this is blocking that was put in when they put the metal wheel in. So what does that tell us about the history of the wheel and the wheel pit? Well, it seems that we had a, a wide wheel working off a lesser head of water. And later on, in the quest for more power, more productivity in the mill, they put in a bigger water wheel, an overshot wheel, and that way, by raising the head of water, by embanking the pond and getting a bit better head of water coming into the wheel pit, they could put in a narrower water wheel. So it was more powerful because the water was coming from higher? Absolutely right. With an overshot wheel, you've got the best arrangement. And because of our archaeologists' detective work, we now have a pretty good idea of what Buck Mill would have looked like right back to the 17th century. This earliest phase of mill could have been built by John Benjafield between 1660 and 1680, at which point the mill would have had a much wider water wheel. In the 18th century, another pair of millstones were added. Around the 1830s, the more primitive wooden wheel would have been removed and replaced by the cast iron overshot wheel, which required fundamental changes to the water supply and wheel pit. Buck Mill had a leet bringing water from the stream over a mile up the valley. So it would have been a remarkable feat of engineering that supported not only generation after generation of Miller, but the entire community around them. And only this morning we thought we'd be leaving Stephanie with a more confused picture of her mill's history than when we arrived. Please, we came. No, it's all been a terrible inconvenience. Go Look on. at the mess. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm pleased you came. This has been, it's been a brilliant three days. In fact, I'm really sad you're going. <laughs> what have we learned? Oh, an enormous amount. I mean, not only about the building that you asked us to come and look at, which is all these phases of development and reflects mill development generally, but also the whole valley. I know you don't like it, but we think we've got too many real mills down there as well. That's a real bonus, that is. If ever you or your horses stumble on a medieval mill in one of your fields... I'll let you know. Yeah, cos he's getting a bit desperate. <laughs> it's the stuff of legend, a weapon that burnt people alive. Tony's back on Thursday night here on 4 with a Time Team special, the Somme's secret weapon at 9. Tonight at 8 is our lack of self-belief risking our entire future. The last in the series, Civilization, is the West history. Next, though, the Channel 4 News.